I'm Niall Gagan, a licensed clinical psychologist in Berkeley, California. In this training, I'm going to go in depth into one of my favorite experiential techniques, the symptom deprivation. The symptom deprivation was developed by the originators of coherence therapy, Bruce Ecker and Laurel Hulley. You'll be able to find more information on them and their work at the website of the Coherence Psychology Institute, www.coherencetherapy.org. There's a wealth of information there, including their classic book, Depth-Oriented Brief Therapy, How to Be Brief When You Are Trained to Be Deep, and Vice Versa. This is the book that started me down the path of working experientially after years of psychodynamic training in grad school. It's a must read for anyone who's interested in experiential psychotherapy or coaching. Equally important is their more recent book, Unlocking the Emotional Brain, Eliminating Symptoms at Their Roots Using Memory Reconsolidation, which lays out a map for how the proper use of experiential techniques can activate the neurobiological process of memory reconsolidation. You'll also find links to trainings, demonstration sessions, and lots of other great resources at their site, so I really encourage you to go check it out. This training is part of a series I'm developing to help you use a whole range of powerful experiential techniques, some from coherence therapy, others that originated from other experiential schools. If you haven't worked experientially before, this training should give you a solid basis from which to get started. If you're already working experientially, it'll help you make your prompts even more powerful and effective. Because I find it to be such a particularly useful prompt, I've started the series with the symptom deprivation. I talk to therapists and coaches about working experientially all the time and find that most have an idea as to what that means. But when I start to give actual examples of experiential prompts, there often turns out to be a big difference between what I'm talking about and what they had in mind. So in order to eliminate the possibility of misunderstanding, I've filled this training with specific examples of symptom deprivations for common presenting symptoms. I believe the best way to teach experiential therapy is to make the training itself as experiential as possible. So as we go along, I'll suggest periodically that you pause the video and take a moment to imagine how you'd create a symptom deprivation for the situation in question. I'll provide a few cues to help you get started. Then you'll restart the video and watch my version of the same prompt. There's no best way to create any experience, so your version and mine may well differ and both be great options. Although this training is focused specifically on the symptom deprivation, most of these tips will be helpful for any type of experiential prompt. But before we get into those specific points, let's start with a brief overview of what the symptom deprivation is. A key concept I learned from Ecker and Hulley was that every presenting symptom exists for some important reason. Of course, those reasons are often outside of one's conscious awareness, which is why clients come into therapy not understanding why their symptoms are so persistent. The task of the therapist is to discover what it is in this client's internal world of meaning, in the logic of this client's unconscious mind that makes sense of the presenting symptom. To say the same thing in another way, clients generally come to us from the position that, I don't want this symptom. It doesn't benefit me in any way. It only causes me trouble. For example, I don't want these anxiety attacks. There's no reason for me to feel as anxious as I do. The anxiety is just an out of control reaction my body goes into, and I want it to stop. Or another version might be, it makes no sense that I can't stop overeating. It's bad for my health. It makes me feel bad about my body. Every day I say I'm going to stop, but then I find myself overeating again. I don't know why I can't stop. It's not that the therapist disagrees that these presenting symptoms are problematic or need to be changed, but whereas clients tend to see their symptoms as pointless or inexplicable, the therapist assumes that somewhere within this client's internal world of meaning, there's a hidden, unconscious logic that not only makes sense of, 
but actually necessitates the existence of each presenting symptom. Although they may not say it in exactly the same words, most, if not all, schools of experiential psychotherapy on our site would hold that as a basic premise. It's so key for the purpose of this particular training that I'm going to say it again. The therapist's primary task is to find out what unconscious belief or beliefs, because there may be more than one, or what implicit knowing, if you will, makes sense of this presenting symptom. A variety of experiential techniques can be used to unearth those unconscious beliefs or meanings, but the symptom deprivation is one of my go-tos in my work with my own clients. In a symptom deprivation, the therapist prompts the client to imagine a vivid, realistic life situation in which the symptom would normally occur, then invites the client to imagine that same situation with the symptom absent from the picture. In other words, the client is temporarily deprived of the symptom. I find that many clinicians find it helpful to think of this as symptom removal instead of symptom deprivation, since that's quite literally what the therapist is prompting the client to do. Imagine the scenario in which the symptom would usually be present, but with the symptom removed from the experience. One might think that removing the symptom would cause the client to feel nothing but relief. But what we discover time and again is that something that might at first seem counterintuitive happens, which is that the client actually displays signs of discomfort or distress. Sometimes these are overt and obvious, like the clients whose eyes get big, or who shakes her head and says, ugh, or the client who sits back abruptly in his chair while raising his hands in a protective stance. Those types of reactions are hard not to spot. More often, though, we're looking for subtler signals, like just the tiniest pause in speech, or tightening of the throat, a flicker of hesitation in the eyes, a barely perceptible tensing of the jaw or tapping of the fingers. What these signals reveal, and what the client experientially bumps into in that moment, is that the symptom, while painful, actually serves a very important purpose. The presence of the symptom allows the client to remain unaware of some even worse suffering that she's been unconsciously motivated to avoid, even more than the symptom itself. Ecker and Hulley refer to this as the two sufferings. The first suffering is the symptom that brings the client into therapy, whether it's anxiety, depression, anger, low self-worth, or a long list of presenting symptoms that are familiar to us all. That's the suffering that the client is consciously aware of. The task of the experiential therapist is to help the client discover the other, deeper suffering, the one that the client unconsciously fears even more, but manages not to experience as long as she keeps being focused only on the first. Before I get into specific tips for how to use the symptom deprivation most effectively, let's look at a few examples that illustrate this point. A client comes to therapy saying her primary goal is to stop micromanaging so much and start delegating better at work. The therapist wonders what part of this client's psyche could be unconsciously preventing her from delegating to her team. To find out, the therapist prompts her to picture herself farming certain tasks out to her team while she turns her attention towards tasks that only she can do. Although that's exactly the change she said she wants to make, as she visualizes herself doing it, she makes an uncomfortable face. As the therapist has her attend mindfully to that, she becomes aware of a growing sense of dread and some words spring to mind. Everything's going to get out of control. As she attends to this reaction, a vivid memory arises of growing up as the oldest of four children with neglectful parents, knowing that if she doesn't hover over her siblings like a hawk and monitor their every move, everything will go wrong and it will all be her fault. By imagining not hovering over her team at work, she becomes aware that up till now she's been unconsciously mapping her childhood experience onto her current day work situation. Some part of her, outside of awareness till now, has quote unquote known that if I don't hover, everything will spin out of control and it will all be my fault. So I've got to keep a close eye on every single thing that goes on here.
Here's another example. A client says she wants to not always be such a wallflower in social situations, like at parties. The therapist thinks there must be some part of this client that knows something about how others are or about how she is that makes it compelling to keep taking on the wallflower role. To discover more about this, the therapist prompts the client to picture herself at an upcoming friend's party. Normally she'd keep to herself, but the therapist has her imagine that she overhears a discussion about a topic she really knows about and prompts her to picture herself walking over and joining the conversation in an animated, engaged way. This is exactly how she said she wants to be at parties, but as she pictures actually doing it, she becomes aware of an intense feeling of vulnerability and a sense of shame washes over her. The therapist just has her attend mindfully to these feelings, and as she sits with them, a painful memory comes to mind, that when she would express herself naturally and spontaneously as a child, her older brother would ridicule her in front of the neighborhood kids who would all laugh at her. In response to imagining herself not disappearing at the party, she becomes aware that even though she surrounded herself in her current day life with people who are very different than her brother and the neighborhood kids, there's a part of her to this day that still expects humiliation if she expresses herself or allows herself to be too visible in a group. For this part of her, Staying somewhat removed and in a wallflower role is the logical solution for how to stay safe. So to recap, when used correctly, a symptom deprivation directly accesses hidden knowings, meanings, or developmental learnings that underlie the presenting symptom. In my experience, many therapists love the idea of this technique but don't necessarily feel confident enough about their ability to do it on the fly to actually integrate it into their work. That's why the rest of this training will provide specific tips and pointers that will help you create powerful symptom deprivations with your clients. The first key to creating a powerful symptom deprivation is to remember that it's not as simple as just telling the client to imagine life without the symptom. When therapists try this technique with their clients for the first time, their instinct is often to say something like, can you imagine what it would be like not to be depressed? Or imagine yourself talking to the students in your classroom without getting mad and losing control. There are a few problems with this. For one thing, sometimes you're asking the client to imagine something she's never experienced before. Therefore, can't really even conceive of. For example, if someone's never felt anything but anxiety in social situations, and you prompt her, imagine yourself not feeling anxious at the company holiday party, you're likely to get a blank look in response. One way to avoid this trap is to avoid using the word not in our prompts. I'm told that Milton Erickson, the master therapeutic hypnotist, taught that the unconscious mind can't hear the word not. As a result, he made sure to always use positive framing in his work. Now, I don't pretend to be an authority on hypnosis, but I can say for sure that this holds true when you're creating symptom deprivations. So rather than suggesting to the client what not to experience, we describe what we do want her to experience. That means fully engaging our creativity and imagination to create a vivid and detailed sense of what it would be like for the client to be in that situation if the symptom didn't exist. The goal is to paint such a clear picture that it takes the client right there, even if it's an experience she's never had or would have difficulty imagining on her own. Let's look at a few examples. Consider the difference between these two different versions of the same prompt for a client who complains of feeling anxious in professional contexts, like at networking events. In both versions, the therapist is attempting to discover what it is that this client unconsciously knows about herself or others that makes her enter a state of anxiety in a networking event. But in the first version, the therapist creates a prompt based on the abstract idea of not feeling anxious. While in the second, the therapist actively creates an experience for the client of what it would be like to be there with that anxiety. <music> 
So in this version, the therapist tells her, I want you to picture yourself arriving at that networking lunch you mentioned earlier. I think you said you met a colleague at a restaurant over the weekend. But this time, I want you to imagine yourself arriving at the restaurant, not feeling anxious. What do you notice? It's possible that that could be effective. But notice the difference when the therapist actively creates an experience of what it could be like for the client to arrive at the lunch meeting without anxiety. Let's go back and take a look at that moment as you're first arriving at that networking lunch you mentioned earlier. But this time I want you to imagine it a little differently. As you're approaching the table where your colleague is sitting, to your surprise, you notice that you feel good. Your body is loose and calm and relaxed all the way through from your head down to your feet. In fact, you even notice that in this relaxed state, you're able to feel kind of curious and even excited about this connection you're about to make. And you have an optimistic sense that something mutually beneficial could really come of it. Tell me, what's happening in your system? What's your actual internal response as you imagine this? As you can imagine, these two variations are likely to have very different levels of impact. The first version, might just cause the client to draw a blank, or at the very least, cause her to go up into her head in an effort to conceptualize what not anxious might be like. That's counterproductive in experiential work, where our whole goal is to get the client out of her cognitive mind so she can get in touch with knowings that are held in her emotional brain and in the body. As the therapist leads her through the more vivid, detailed scenario, she's much more likely to bump into whatever fear or discomfort would actually arise in the symptom-free state. Hi again. Sorry to interrupt just as things were getting going. What you've just watched gives you a good taste of what this training will be like. Part one will suggest 10 specific tips, each illustrated with multiple case examples, that'll show how to create symptom deprivations for common presenting symptoms. It'll also provide opportunities for you to experiment with creating symptom deprivations for some of those presenting issues, with coaching from me to help guide you through the process. I wish we could just offer the entire training for free. But as I'm sure you can imagine, it takes an incredible amount of time, work, and resources to create a presentation like this. I've got ideas for trainings on lots of other experiential techniques, but in order to keep creating them, and for them not to take as long as this one did, I'll need your support. Since our goal is to grow the number of therapists and coaches who work experientially worldwide, we want to make sure our trainings are affordable to everyone, including students and interns. For that to be sustainable, we'll need each one to get lots of views. So I'm asking you to help spread the word by sharing the YouTube link to this free portion with as many people as you can think of who might be interested. Just copy and paste the link that's right below this video into an email, text, social media page, or whatever works for you. Another way would be to click on YouTube's share icon and follow their instructions. That's also just below this video and is often the easiest way to share from a phone or a tablet. To access the full training, follow the link to our website, experiential-psychotherapies.com. That clickable link will show up in just a few moments. If for some reason that doesn't work, you'll also find another copy of that link just below this video. Thanks for watching and for helping spread the word, and enjoy the rest of the training.